Hi, so for today, we're going to talk about fluid mechanics and the basics of fluid mechanics. Okay, this is an introductory subject for civil engineering or mechanical engineering in their uh, major course, fluid mechanics. Okay, so we're going to discuss in this video, I'm going to discuss the basics only of the fluid mechanics. So let us start with some definition of terms. What is fluid mechanics? Fluid mechanics is basically the branch of science that which deals with the study or and the behavior of fluids such as gases or liquids. The misconception all about fluids is that when we talk about fluids, the first thing that uh, comes to our mind is that fluid is limited to a liquid form. But in the case of the study of fluid mechanics, fluid is not only in liquid form, but basically a fluid is any substance that can flow either a liquid or a gas. Meaning to say, even a gas can be considered as fluid. Why? Because it can flow. Okay? So, in the study of fluid, that is the basic definition of fluid mechanics. So, we have two branches of fluid mechanics. And we have the fluid statics, which is, which is the study of fluids at rest, meaning the fluid is not moving. Okay? It's just resting. Okay? So, the magnitude of forces acting along that fluid is zero because it is at rest. Uh, rest in equilibrium situations. And we have the fluid dynamics. Once this fluid starts to move, then we are talking about fluid dynamics here. And this fluid dynamics is much way more complicated or complex than the fluid statics because now the fluid is now uh, moving. Okay? So here is are some important quantities when, when talking about fluid, uh, fluid mechanics. So we have what we call the density of the material. So what is this density? Basically, density is defined as the mass per unit volume. Okay. So it is basically represented by a Greek alphabet rho. And that is equivalent to mass of the substance over the volume of the substance. Okay. Wherein our unit for density is, as a unit is, kilogram per cubic meter because volume is cubic per meter. Okay? A homogeneous material that is a material that has uh, the same material uh, uh, composition of material has the same density. In other words, for example, we have a, the same uh, steel wrench here and steel nail. They are both steel. Though they have different shape and different mass, okay, their density is the same because they are a homogeneous material. They are composed of the same material. So different mass, same density for steel wrench and steel nail regardless of their size and regardless of their mass. So because the wrench and nail are both made of steel, they have the same density, mass per unit volume. And again, density is... Uh, important parameter on whether we the, the object would actually sink or float okay when submerged into a liquid okay so density that is basically the density so here are some densities of some common substances we have uh, the most common is water wherein the density of water is 1 times 10 raised to 3 kilogram per cubic meter so that is the density of water for every element we have uh, the density, the constant density, okay? So, do we need to memorize all of this? Not necessarily, but we have to take note what is the density of water because sometimes in the problem, it's not given. So, that is basically 1 times 10 raised to 3 kilogram per cubic meter. And we have the air, 1.2 kilogram per cubic meter. We have the ethanol, the benzene, the ice, and different uh, elements here, okay? So, we have the densities of some common materials. Okay? So, let's try to solve a problem. Okay? I've written the problem here. So, for our problem number one, find the mass and weight of the air at 20 degrees Celsius, that is in Celsius, in a living room with a 4 meters by 5 meters in a ceiling of 3 meters high. So, basically, we're asked to find the... Uh, mass of the air and the weight of the air inside the room. So, what is the mass of the air? What is the weight of that air? Okay? Using the formula 
density is equals to mass over volume, we can calculate the air, the mass of the air inside the room. So, of course, inside the air, inside the room, we have the density of air is equals to the mass of air divided by the volume of the room. Okay? So, what are we going to do is to get the mass of the air simply we cross multiply that. Okay? Mass of the air is simply density of the air times the volume of the room. Okay? So, the density of air is shown a while ago, 1.2 kilogram per cubic meter. And the volume of the room is that that is a cube. So, because we have uh, not a cube necessarily. So, we have a 4 meter by 5 meter by 3 meters. So, length times width times height of the room. So, we have 4 meters multiplied by 5 meters multiplied by 3 meters. Okay. And this should give us this meter, cubic meter will cancel. Okay. And that should give us 72 kilograms if I'm not mistaken. So, let's try to verify. So, 72 kilograms. That is the mass of the air inside that room. How about the weight of the air? Well, actually, we know that the weight of the air is simply the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. That is 72 kilograms multiplied by 9.81 meter per second squared. And the weight should be in Newton. So, that is 72 times 9.81. That should be 706. 706.32 newtons. That should be our answer for the weight and the mass of the air. Okay? So, this is our computation. Okay? We have the same answer. Okay? So, how about pressure? Pressure is also an important uh, quantity when we are talking about fluid mechanics. And pressure is basically defined as the amount of force exerted on a given area. This force is actually perpendicular to the normal or the surface area of the, uh, the, the object. Okay? So, and its SI unit is given in Pascal. Okay? And Pascal is denoted by PA. And of course, the unit of uh, pressure is denoted by 1 newton meter per meter squared is actually equal to 1 pascal. So in other words, if we're going to write, oops, if we're going to write the pressure equation, so pressure is defined as the force per unit area. And the unit of force is actually 1 newton divided by this SI unit of area is meter squared. So, we say that the unit of pressure is, let's say, 1 Pascal denoted by 1 PA. And that is basically equivalent to 1 Newton per meter square. Okay? And we say that this force is actually what? It's actually always perpendicular to the surface to which it acts. For example, we have this uh, plate, okay, object with an area A. So, the force acting should be always perpendicular to the normal or the surface of the object. So, that is the pressure. So, in our equation, if you're going to look at this equation, if we increase the force acting per unit area, well, of course, if we, if the, the pressure here is actually force over area. What if we double the force? Okay, what will happen is that since this is the, since force is directly proportional to the pressure, so we will be having force our uh, pressure is equal to twice the F over A. So our pressure will increase actually by two also because of the increase in the force. So what will happen if uh, if we try to apply a force to a very small area, okay, much smaller than this. So, what will happen? Let's say we have here an object, okay? And it's acted by a force. This has an area A prime, which is basically smaller than this. So, we have the same force applied. So, the, the pressure here is actually much greater than the pressure here because 
the area is now smaller. And we, if we decrease the area to which the force is acting, what will happen to the pressure? It would increase. Okay? So because this has the area and the pressure has a indirectly proportional or indirectly proportional to each other or inversely proportional to each other, so that if we're going to decrease the area, the pressure will increase. And of course, increasing the area to which the force is acting upon will, will also decrease the pressure. Okay? So that, that's the basic concept of the pressure. So in other words, if the applied force is acting on a small area, then the pressure will be large and vice versa. Okay? So take note that pressure has many units. Its SI units is only given by Pascal. But uh, we can convert pressure in uh, different types of units such as store, MMHG, bar, okay, ATM. Okay, we have many units for pressure. But for now, we're going to talk about the Pascals. Okay? Again, the area here is the cross-sectional area of the object to which the force is acting. So something to think about when we are dealing with pressure. For ladies, do you feel pain or pressure whenever you wear your high heels for a long time well of course some of our friends uh, was going to party Th those ladies are wearing uh, uh, high heels maybe five inches so what happens uh, the tendency is that whenever they they wear that for a very long time uh, they will feel pain in their feet okay or even in their legs why? Because there is the presence of pressure. If you are going to recall from our equation a while ago that the pressure is inversely proportional to the area, cross-sectional area. So, for example, your friend is wearing a high heels. So, the tendency is that the weight now become, becomes the force because weight is also a force. So, it is now acting on the very uh, small cross-sectional area of the heels. Imagine, of course, if we're going... To, uh, to draw that so let's just make this as, a, as an exaggeration okay suppose this is the heels of your friend and this is the force acting okay on this heel of the shoes of the five inch shoes of your uh, heels of your friend so this force is actually her weight okay and it, let's say that if the weight is of the user of your friend is really large, in other words, is a really, uh, little chubby, uh, what will happen is that the, the pressure that your uh, uh, feet will feel is very large because the cross section here is, a, is, used as, is actually a very small square, okay? Area of a square, so very small area. So that's why we cannot actually wear or ladies cannot actually bear uh, wearing that high heels for a very long time because the area to which their weight acting is acting is on a very, very small area. Okay, compared to when we wear shoes, okay, the, the normal shoes, the area of our shoes, okay, is really, really um, um, large compared to the area when wearing high heels, okay? So, the, the point is that there is a great pressure in the high heels of your friend who is going to wear these high heels, okay? So, number two, do you feel pressure when you are at the ground level and sometimes and then use the elevator to go to a much higher level in a building, okay? So, well, of course, sometimes when we are at the, at the ground level and we try to ride the elevator and that from ground, to 30, let's say that is constantly going up. Okay, so what happens is that the tendency is we feel pressure in our ears. Okay, and sometimes there is a thickening sound in our uh, ears because of the pressure. Okay, so not only because the pressure is limited by this formula, but also the pressure is actually has another formula of which. The pressure to which our body feels is actually equal also into what we call the rho GH and it is a function of height. So rho GH is actually the rho is the density, G is the gravitational force, okay, gravitational force, 
observation due to gravity and this is now the height so whenever we go to a higher elevation we experience pressure for example we, we, we ride a flight from Manila to Davao we're, we're actually riding a an airplane so at the very uh, high height you now we feel pressure in our ears because pressure is also a function of height so we have this following formula pressure is also equal to rho gh so number three do you feel pressure when you have tried to swim at the very bottom of the swimming pool well actually uh, we always feel that whenever we try to swim at the very bottom of the swimming pool if, if you don't uh, know how to swim you know, good for you <laughs> you don't feel any pressure but but most of us maybe have experienced this that whenever we go deeper okay in the into the deep of the swimming pool what happens is that the tendency is we feel pressure in our nose okay and maybe in our ears and maybe maybe in our head because of the pressure and uh that is all because of the formula rho g h so suppose we have a tank filled with the fluid of density rho that just like what i've said a while ago that pressure is equals to rho g h okay so at the very bottom of this tank Okay, there is a pressure, and that pressure is actually rho gh. Okay, not including the what we call the atmospheric pressure, but what we, later on we'll be discussing that. So this equation helps us understand why the deeper we go underwater, the greater the pressure our body feels. Okay, so atmospheric pressure. There is also what we call the atmospheric pressure, and that is basically defined as the p sub atm. Okay. And when do we use that constant okay, for atmospheric pressure? Well, of course, if we're going to use that, for an open tank, we should include the pressure outside the tank pressing on the top of the surface of the fluid. Or in other words, whenever we have an open, okay, an open uh, tank and it is actually acted by the atmospheric pressure, and if we're going to measure the very pressure at the very bottom of that tank, we should include the atmospheric pressure. For you to analyze what I'm trying to say is that whenever we have an open tank, and this tank, for example, is actually filled with water, okay, up to this level, to a height H, if we want to, to measure the pressure at this point, at the very bottom of the, of the tank, what is the pressure there? So, there is what we call the atmospheric pressure. And for every open tank, we must include that in our uh, uh, computation. So, the pressure at the very bottom of this tank is the atmospheric pressure okay, multiplied by the pressure due to rho GH. So, the total pressure at the very bottom for an open tank acted by the pressure or the air is actually the pressure atmospheric pressure plus the what we call the rho g h okay so atmospheric pressure is actually equal to 101.3 kilopascals and that is equivalent to 764 equal to 760 mmhg and that is basically equal to 1 atm all of these are units of pressure Okay, so 101.3 kilopascal, or in other words, one, one other words, 101.325 kilopascals for accurate uh, computations. Okay, so for this problem, the swimming pool, fresh or salt water. So compare the total pressure at the bottom of a swimming pool of a depth three meters, for about nine nine feet ata or eight feet, if it is filled with fresh water and sea water. So first, we're going to compute the pressure when we are when we go we are going to use the uh, fresh water. Okay. So let's calculate the pressure. So for example, here is our pool. Okay. Here is our pool. Okay. This pool is filled with what we call the fresh water. Okay, fresh water first. And its height, okay, is actually 3 meters. So that is for a 3 meters height. So we're going to compute now the total pressure at the very bottom 
of this spoon. So the total pressure is actually P total is P ATM because this is an open swimming pool. So we have to include the pressure due to atmospheric pressure. Oops. So that is uh, added to the pressure rho G H. So we're going to include pressure, atmospheric pressure. This is for num letter A. So 101.325 or 101.3. Let's be consistent. Okay. The, thought, the pressure, atmospheric pressure is 101.3 kilopascals plus the rho. What is this? The density of water is 1 times 10 raised to 3 kilogram per cubic meter multiplied by 9.81 meter per second squared and that should be multiplied by 3 meters. So what are we going to get here is actually 101.3 kilopascals 1 times 10 raised to 3. Okay, let me just compute 9.81 then 3 meters. So... 130.73 okay so let's check okay or 1.31 times 10 raised to 5 pascal so 1.31 times 10 raised to 5 pascals or engineering in engineering notation we have 130.73 uh, kilo pascals so what will happen if we're going to replace this fresh water, this fresh water by salt water? Now for salt water, what will happen is that the same computation, we have to include the atmospheric pressure plus the rho of now the C or the salt water times the G times the height. Well, of course, the only thing that uh, changed here is the density of the uh, object. So from fresh water to sea water. So we have uh, total pressure is actually equal to 101.3 kilopascals plus the density of water, of uh, sea water, is 1.03 times 10 raised to uh, 3 kilogram per cubic meter multiplied by g 9.81 times the height the same that is 3 so the total pressure if we're going to compute for that is 101.3 kilopascals plus 1 time 1.03 times 10 raised to 3 9.81 times 3 and that is 1. what 1.32 1.32 times 10 raised to 5 pascals or in, in engineering notation we have 131.131.6129 pascals or kilopascals I'm sorry kilopascals so this is in terms of kilopascals All right. So there is a big difference in the pressure at the very bottom of the swimming pool, if it is in fresh water and salt water. As you can see here, the, the pressure at the very bottom of the swimming pool, if it is fresh water, is given by 1.31 times 10 raised to 5 pascal. Whereas for salt water, that is 1.32 times 10 raised to 5 pascal. There is a great difference. So that the determining difference here is actually because of the density, the difference of their density. So that's why we, we have to conclude that whenever we swim, we try to swim at the very bottom of a fresh water, the pressure is not really that great. But when you try to swim at the very bottom of a salt water or sea water, what will happen is that the tendency is that you will uh, feel a greater pressure. Why? Because the density again of the sea water is much greater than the density of the fresh water. Okay. So let's go back to our discussion. So conversion of conversion of pressure units, we have different conversion of pressure units because we have many uh, units of pressure. So Pascal denoted by PA, 1 PA is equals to 1 Newton per square meter. And we have what we call the bar. 
bar is a unit of pressure also and 1 bar is equal to 0 0.1 megapascals. That is a huge amount of pressure. So 0 0.1 megapascals is actually equal to 0 0.1 times 10 raised to 6 pascals. We have the water column meter. Okay, that is the equivalent conversion units. Honestly, I don't know that. Okay, for the... Uh, I really uh, haven't encountered that during my time in my college. But uh, I hope someday you will encounter that in your uh, major subjects. So we have the atmospheric pressure, 1 ATM. ATM, 1 ATM is basically equal to this. The pressure, atmospheric pressure is 101, 325. Pascals, or what we have uh, recorded a while ago, that is 101.3 times 10 days to uh, uh, 101.3 kilopascals. So the most uh, more accurate is 101.325 kilopascals or 101.325 pascals. So we have the mercury column meter given by this uh, conversion, and we have the tor. Tor is a unit of pressure, and that one tor is equal to one millimeter. Hg of pressure. Okay, that's basic. The basic uh, conversion of pressure units. So let's go now to Pascal's principle. So Pascal principle states that a change in the pressure applied to a fluid is transmitted undiminished to every point in the fluid and to the walls of the container. In other words, Pascal's principle: whenever we have a fluid inside and we apply force that results to a pressure on the left side. The pressure on the left side must be always equal to the pressure on the right side of the container. Okay? The pressure trans is transmitted undiminished to every point in the fluid. So in the absence of the gravity, the pressure is the same everywhere in the vessel. So remember that pressure is a scalar quantity. But the force is actually a vector. So, but the pressure is scalar even though the force is vector. And the force is always perpendicular to the cross-sectional area. So what will happen here is that if we have, for example, one application of Pascal's principle is actually what we call the hydraulic jack. This hydraulic or hydraulic press or hydraulic jack, this hydraulic press is actually uh, used to lift cars in a car lifting uh, service station or in a... Um, company where cars are being uh, manufactured, okay? So, consider a hydraulic press or a hydraulic jack. This hydraulic jack is filled with fluid inside. So, Pascal principle states that the pressure on the left side, this left side, must be equal to the pressure on the right side. So, well, of course, for example, if you have this hydraulic press, okay, if we apply force here on the left side, okay, for this cross-sectional area, A sub 1, we are actually producing the pressure because this force is acting perpendicular to the cross-sectional area, A sub 1. And according to Pascal, if we create pressure here, the pressure we created here must be also equal to the pressure that is produced here. So actually, if we're going to apply force here, fluid will be displaced so that there will be a force upward, F sub 2, that is acting on the much bigger cross-sectional area of this hydraulic press, A sub 2. So, but the pressure remains the same according to Pascal's. Okay? So, what are we, I'm trying to say is that uh, because of the equal pressure on the left side and on, on the right side, we have this following formula. Okay? So, F1 is equal to A1, that is pressure 1. That is equal to F2 over A2 because the pressures are equal. So, because the increase in pressure is the same on the two sides, a small force on F1 produces a much greater force F2. So, uh, let me just go back to our image. Okay? So, let us assume that the smaller area, we call that A1, and the smaller force, we call that F1. And the bigger area we produce, or the bigger force we produce is F2, and the bigger area side of the hydraulic press is what we call the A2. So, let's just try to compute, okay? So, for us to really see the uh, beauty of Pascal's principle. So, we have, let's say that P1 is equal to P2 according to Pascal's principle. And if we're going to 
elaborate this f1 over a1 and that is equal to f2 over a2 suppose we want to find the f1 this f1 is the force that we are going to apply on the left side okay to carry or to lift up a car with a higher uh, area a sub 2 so let's go let's let's say we we need to isolate f1 so we have a1 divided by a2 multiplied by f2 okay and let's say class that the area of one or the smaller piston or on the left side of the hydraulic press is equal let's say to uh what do we call this let's say 100 meters squared and well of course a2 let's say one meters square meter Okay, so ah, let me just make this clear so that uh, what are we trying to get here is F2 instead of F1. I'm so sorry. So we have to get F2 because F2 is where we have to lift the car. That is the right side where we have to lift the car. So when we get F2, F2 or the force on 2 should be what A2 over A1 multiplied by the force 1. Let's say that A2 or the area to which the car is being is to be lifted up, let's say that the area of that is, let's say, 100 square meter. Okay? Let's just exaggerate this. Okay? So, and the area of 1 to which we are going to uh, apply the force, okay? this area is the smaller area on the left side of our hydraulic jack. Let's say that is 1 square meter. Okay? And... What, what if, what are we going to do is to apply one newton of force on the left side of the hydraulic press. So, if we're going to compute for the force 2, we have A2, the area 2 is 100 meters square, over 1 meter square, then multiply that by 1 newton. Okay, let's say 1 newton. What will happen is that upon evaluating the F2, what will happen is that this would cancel and we are left with 100 times 1 newton so that we are able to produce 100 newton only by applying 1 newton. So no wonder why this hydraulic jack could actually perform the lifting of the cars because small force that we are going to apply on the left side of the hydraulic press would create a greater force on the right side because of the equality in pressure okay so what i'm trying to say is this is our force one one newton a while ago acted by a small area sub one that is the, our one square meter then the force that will be produced on the other side or the right side of the hydraulic press would be 100 newton imagine from one newton to 100 newton with with perfect design or with a good design of the diameter or the area of this uh, hydraulic presses where we can actually lift up cars in a very easy way okay so of course the same amount of fluid lives on the left and enters on the right side this is actually the volume a1 times the displacement one is equal to a1 b2 no volume of uh, the fluid is left okay or is actually uh, what do you call this uh, lost a force of magnitude one well of course uh, we have seen this a while ago oops so well of course the work done on the left side of the hydraulic press is also equal to the work done on the right side of the hydraulic press so let's try to have some sample problems okay so we have a car that weighs 10 kilonewton is placed on the one meter radius piston of hydraulic press how much force should be exerted in the 5 cm radius piston to lift the car? Let me just see if I have copy paste it here. Okay, so I haven't copy paste it here. So we have to uh, answer this. A car that weighs 10 kN is placed on the 1 meter radius. Well, actually, in, in, uh, in solving hydraulic uh, presses problems, 
So we must consider the high, the Pascal's principle, P1 is equal to P2, and we must always look for is the the smaller radius. Okay, if we find the smaller radius, which will in this case one meter and five centimeters, the smaller radius is five centimeter. So five centimeters should be our R1. That should be the left side. Okay. So, what I'm trying to say is that we have R1 is given by 5 centimeters. The problem is asking is how much force should be exerted in the 5 centimeters. So, if that is the R1, this should be the force 1 to which the force is being applied. Okay. In order to lift the car on the other side. So, that's the unknown, the F1. And we have here... 10 kilonewtons, by the way, 10 kilonewtons is also a force, that is the F2, 10 kilonewtons, and our R2 is actually 1 meter. Okay, so applying Pascal's principle, we have P1 is equals to P2, that is F1 over A1 is equals to F2 over A2, and we are asked to find for the F1, so F1 will now be equal to A1, over A2 multiplied by the F2. So we have now the area. We have to be really careful in this. We are given the radius, not the area. But to get the area, we are asked to find the cross-sectional area. So the cross-sectional area is actually a uh, circle. Okay. So we have pi. We have to convert this 5 cm into meters so that we have 0 0.05 meters squared over pi multiplied by area of 2 that is 1 meter squared. We have nothing, uh, we have no problem with that. And that is basically multiplied by the weight of the car. Okay, so what are we going to do here is simply as we can see, pi's will cancel. Okay. And multiply that by 10 kilonewton. So we have the answer 25 newtons. So it's very uh, amazing. Why? Because we can lift the car on the right side of the hydraulic press by just simply applying 25 newtons on the left side of the hydraulic press. How cool is that, right? So even 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 you, you can uh, actually. Uh, lift the car so uh, the best example of that is that the, the mechanics we can see here we can see them uh, trying to lift the car by what we call the hydraulic press okay by continuously applying force so that they are able to lift the car okay that's one basic application of the hydraulic press number two or problem number two in a car lift used in a service station compressed air exerts a force on a small piston that has a radius of 5 cm this pressure is transmitted by a liquid to a piston that has a radius of 15 cm. So we have two radiuses again. And 5 cm is the R1 because it's smaller. R2 is the 15 cm. So what are we going to do is to write the given R1 is 5 cm. R2 is 15 cm. Okay. So what force must the compressed air exert to lift a car weighing 13,300 Newtons. So that 13,300 newtons, well, of course, is on the right side, and that should be the weight of the car. That should be F2. Okay. 13,300 newton. What air pressure produces this force? So we have two questions here. What force should be exerted on the left side of the hydraulic press in order for this 13,300 newton of car to be lifted up? That is again F1. And we have derived again the F1 by the formula F1 is equals to A1 over A2 multiplied by F2. So we have now A1, okay, the area of 1, cross-sectional area. We have to convert this again into meters. So pi R1, 0 0.05 meters squared over area of 2, pi over 0 0.15 meters squared. And that should be multiplied by the force to 13,300 newtons. That is the weight of the car. 0 0.05 squared, 0 0.15 squared. 
multiplied by 13,300. And that should be equal to 147.778 newtons. Let's, let's uh, round it up at 2, 3 decimals. Okay? So that is the amount of force uh, that is needed in order to lift the car in a car lifting service station. So number two, the question is actually what air pressure produces this force? So simply, the problem is asking for us, what is the pressure? Well, since this is hydraulic press, the pressure in the left side is equal to the pressure to the right side so that we can calculate any of the pressure. Let's say pressure 1 is equal to F1 over A1. And our F1 is basically what we have computed here, 1477.778 newtons divided by the area 1. Area 1 is pi 0 0.05 meters squared. And that should result to an answer of, let's see, 188. So 188. 16 times 10 raised to 3 or that is kilo pascals okay that is 188.16 kilo pascals and for pressure 2 we have f2 over a2 okay so what do we expect if we're going to compute p2 since this is an hydraulic press the pressure on the left side is equal to the pressure on the right side so these two pressure must be Yes, you are correct. That must be equal. So we have 13,300 newton for F2 over A2 natin plus is 0 0.15 meters squared. Okay? So 13,300 is pi times 0 0.15 squared. That is also equal to 188.16 kilo pascals. Okay, so that because that works on the principle of the Pascal's law or principle. So, hydrostatic pressure. So, we are going to derive the hydrostatic pressure for this uh, video. And we're going to actually uh, verify if the change in height as we go deeper into the fluid actually affects the pressure. Okay, so I would like you to consider and to listen very carefully, okay, in this discussion. For example, class, we have this uh, figure, okay. So, for example, I have an open tank, and this open tank is actually what? Filled with water, and I get a small amount of, let's say, a cubic size of water here okay that water is sitting still doing nothing and if i'm going to magnify this cube that i get a portion of small portion of water a cube portion of water we're going to zoom it in this is the figure okay i hope you understand what i'm talking about and if we're going to look at this figure class if we're going to look at, look at this figure okay what will happen class is that According to, to our discussion, we have pressure is equal to F over A. And if we're going to manipulate the equation, we have the force is equal to due to pressure PA. So, at the very bottom of the cube of the uh, small cube water, okay, we have a force F1 acting on the very bottom. Okay? That is called the F1 here. And at the very top of the, the cube uh, small element water, water element that we got here is we have also force 2, okay? And of course, this F is actually at height Y. Let's label that as at height Y, the very bottom of the cube, height Y. And the top where the F2 is being experienced, let's call that Y plus delta Y, so that the height is become now what? Delta Y. This height becomes the delta Y. Okay, so what are we going to do, class, is, well, of course, since force is acting perpendicularly to that uh, water or cube of water, small element of water, 
well, we must have also a force acting on the sides, correct? But what happens is that if we have a force acting here on the side, there is also a force acting here on the other side so that it is perpendicular to the surface of the cube. But these two forces cancel each other, so we need not to include that. Sir, but why, why do we have to consider the forces acting on the horizontal or in the y-axis? Those things, those forces will never cancel because this water element, this element that we got on this uh, open tank is actually has a weight. That is what we call the mg. So that if we're going to get the summation, okay, we're going to get the summation of forces along y, that should be equal to zero because this fluid element is static, not moving. Okay? So that if we're going to get the summation of forces along y, positive going upward, we have f1. Negative going downward, we have f2. That is minus mg. So that these two, f1, f2, will never cancel because of the presence of the weight and that should be equal to zero okay so if we're going to uh, this is a cube by the way this is a cube so the surface or the faces of the cube are all squares and they are all equal okay so if we're going to manipulate this force f sub 1 and f sub 2 to convert this okay so this f1 is also equal to pa okay so we have to include the a that is the area of the faces of the cube that we, we call that a okay and this f1 or the pressure is actually yung sa f1 f1 is at the bottom force at the bottom of the uh, element so we have to what include us at the pressure at the height y because it is at the very bottom that and our height there we designate as y minus Again, the area is the same for all cubes. Okay? Then we have F2, the pre the, the, the force at the very both of the very top, that is what we call the y plus delta y. Okay, that is the height. So we have to have P the pressure at P Y plus delta Y at the very top of the liquid element. Minus Mg. So we have to convert M as Delta Y times A times D density. Because as we are going to recall, rho is equals to mass over volume. And if we're going to manipulate this, mass is equals to volume times density. And in this case, to get the volume of this cube, simply we have to multiply the area, okay, the area, area of the base times height. And the height we have considered as delta Y. And, of course, we have to include the density of that material. Okay? So, B, so this term, A times delta Y is the volume. And this rho is the density. So, that we are going to replace that by our M with A, delta Y, rho, multiplied by, of course, the G is equals to 0. Okay? Now, we can cancel what? The areas here. Okay, to look this clean. So, we have Py minus Py plus delta Y minus delta Y rho G is equals to 0. And if you're going to uh, rearrange this equation, okay, rearrange this equation, I'm going to re rearrange it. Negative delta Y rho G, okay, that is equal to what? Positive Py plus delta Y minus py and if we're going to divide this both sides by uh, or multiply this by 1 over delta y what will happen is we have negative rho g here on the left side so we have py plus delta y minus py over delta y okay so and again if we are going to take the limits of both sides for example let me just rewrite this okay we're going to derive the, uh, to get the limits of both sides. So, the limit of delta y as a delta y approaches 0, the limit of negative rho g. And we have to apply it here, the limit of py plus delta y minus py divided by delta y as delta y approaches 0. Let us recall that, the, that this is the definition of basically the derivative. Okay? 
So, and if, if we evaluate the limit of this, since delta y, no delta y here, then this should be constant. So, what will happen is that we have now negative rho g is equal to what? The derivative of pressure with respect to delta y. Okay? So, that what will happen here, class, is that, let's continue, let me just erase this. So, we have now the rho g, negative rho g is equal to dp dy. So, let me just rewrite. Negative rho g is equal to dp, change in pressure with respect to y. We're going to cross multiply this negative rho g dy is equal to dp. And if we're going to integrate this two, okay, uh, integrating this from p1 to p2, integrating this from height 1, to height 2, what will happen? We have a definite integral. So, it is easy to evaluate definite integra integral. We have the integral of dy is y and that is evaluating limits from y1 to y2. And the integral of dp is simply p, evaluating limits from p1 to p2. So, what will happen is that the negative rho g is now equal to y sub 2 minus y sub 1 and equal to p sub 2 minus p sub 1. And if I'm going to multiply this all by negative 1, what do I have to get is, let's say, rho g times y2 minus y1 is equal to p1 minus p2. Now, this is the hydrostatic or the change in pressure whenever we change our height. Okay? So, this y2 and y1 can be replaced as height 2 minus height 1, okay? Because we are dealing with the height, okay? So, we have proven that as we go on deeper, the, the, there is a pressure change because of the change in height, okay? So, that is our formula. So, I have, I have derived it here, okay? So, now we have gotten this formula, okay? So, there's a change in pressure whenever there's a change in height. Okay? So, to continue our discussion, we're going to talk about the buoyant forces and Archimedes principle on the latter part of our study in fluid mechanics. So, have you ever tried to push a boat down underwater? Well, it's very hard to do because there is actually what we call the buoyant force. It is extremely difficult to do to pull down, push down a ball underwater because of the large upward force exerted by the water on the ball. And that's what we call the buoyant force. The buoyant force is actually the force that the water or the liquid uh, exerted on the object, any immersed object. That is what we call the buoyant force. And buoyant force, once again, is the upward force exerted by a fluid on any immersed object. So, for example, we have a cylinder here. And we have a, we make a cylindrical shape here that is being uh, immersed on this water fluid. So we have two forces acting on its top and it, on its bottom. And the buoyant force by formula is actually the magnitude or the resultant of the forces exerted on the top and the bottom of the faces of by the liquid. So in other words, Fb is equals to F1 or F2 minus F1 the resultant of the forces acting on the top and on the bottom of the object. Okay, and we have the Archimedes principle. Archimedes principle only states that the magnitude of the buoyant force on an object by the liquid is always equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. So we have here the formula according to Archimedes principle. We have the buoyant force is equal to the magnitude of the uh, buoyant force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced, okay? So, let's take note of this. This is an important uh, concept or principle, okay? So, as I've said a while ago in the video, what if we have the, the determining factor whether the object will float or sink when it is submerged into a liquid is that its density. So, here is the determining factor. If the density of the fluid is greater than the density of the object, then the object will float. Okay, regardless of their size, regardless of their weight, 
As long as the density of the fluid is greater than the density of that object, the object will float. On the other hand, if the density of the object is greater than the density of the fluid to which it is immersed, the object will sink. So our uh, uh, grandfather would actually joke something about us, which is uh, much massive. Okay, is it the one peso coin or the ship? Okay, if you answer the ship, why does the one peso coin sink and the ship not? If it is much massive than the one peso coin, okay, because the one peso coin is actually uh, has a greater density than the density of the fluid or the water, so that the one peso coin always sink and the the ship will actually by by convention or without any large amount of uh, waves well technically that ship is made of wood and the, the the density of wood is greater than the density of the fluid or, or the sea water then we can conclude that that ship would actually what would actually float okay so the only determining factor whether the object will sink or will float is the density Okay, so the ability to sink or float is completely independent on the dimension of the object or the shape of the object. The only determining factor is the density. So we have here for the first image the sinking stone. We can conclude that the density of this stone is greater than the density of the water to which it is being immersed. And we have the floating wood. Regardless of their size, regard, regardless of their uh, shape, okay, so... It's only determining factor whether it will float or not is the density. So we have now the Bernoulli's equation. When fluids are moving, they are way more complicated than when they are static. So suppose we have a fluid flowing at a pipe. This is our pipe. Okay. If the fluid is static, then forget about V1 and V2. Then and forget about this hydrostatic pressure. Okay. We will no longer use that because this formula is only for uh, fluids that are statics. So how about if they move? For example, we have a pipe here, okay, and this pipe is filled with fluid. Oops, I'm so sorry. So fluid, so that when the uh, fluid flows here, it is flowing through a cross-sectional area 1 and it has a velocity v sub 1. So when this uh, fluid flows here and eventually flows here, there will be a change in pressure. Because actually, the cross-sectional area here is not the same as the cross-sectional area here. And of course, there will be a change in velocity. Why? Because uh, there is also a change in the opening of the tube or the area of the tube. So the, we have the velocity 1 here and we have the velocity 2 here. So of course, if we make a height of which we, we use this as our reference in y1, the y1, and we have y2 here. So there is also the presence of what? The pot potential energy because of the height, the velocity, kinetic energy, the presence of kinetic energy because of the velocity. And of course, the presence of pressure. So in Bernoulli's equation, we have three players. We have the potential energy because there is a height, y1 and y2. And we have velocity 1 and velocity 2, which reminds us of kinetic energy. And we have, of course, the pressure due to difference in area and the force of the fluid acting on that area. Okay? So I would not be really deriving you the Bernoulli's equation because it is a previous derivation. Okay, but rather I would like to take note, I would like you to take note of this formula, which is the famous Bernoulli's equation. We have P1 plus one half the density of that fluid, V sub 1 squared. Okay, the velocity one of that uh, first velocity of the fluid plus rho, which again is the density, G is the gravitational force, and height one is the height of the tube with respect to a certain reference. That is equal to P2 plus 1 half rho V sub 2 squared plus rho GH sub 2. This is the famous Bernoulli's equation. And of course, before we solve the, the, usually the problem here is solving for the velocity at the other end of the tube or the pipe or and solving the pressure. So in other words, before we can solve the uh, pressure, we have to take note of what we call the continuity equation. And the continuity equation is, is simply uh, A1, V1, where A1 is the cross-sectional area for 1 and A2 is the cross-sectional area for 2. 
V1 is the velocity 1 and the velocity 2 during the fluid is moving. Okay? So, let's try to solve a problem about the gasoline problem. The gasoline entering pipe, entering the pipe below at 3 meters per second here, okay? At 140 kilopascals. Compute the speed and pressure at which the liquid leaves the pipe, okay? Compute the pressure and the velocity of the fluid at this point. The, the density of gas is 680 kg per cubic meter. If I'm not mistaken, I have uh, copy-pasted it here. Okay. Again, our formula is, uh, if you have taken note of that, for continuity equation, we have A1V1 is equal to A2V2. We must use first the continuity equation to find the velocity of the fluid at that point, at the second point, to which it leaves the pipe. So, in order for us to get V2, okay, V2 is simply equal to uh, A1 over A2 times the V sub 1. Okay, so A1 is, we can see here from the given, the radius is 4 cm, we have to convert that into meters. And the cross-sectional area of the tube or the pipe is actually A, yes, that's right, a circle, pi 0 0.04 meters squared. Okay, 4 cm 0 0.04 meters squared divided by pi, the area of the other one is 0 0.07 meters squared. That's the radius, I'm so sorry. The area is pi times r squared, pi r squared. Okay, so we have here the formula and multiplied by the velocity one. Velocity one is actually what? 3 meters per second. So, if we're going to compute that, pi's will cancel. So, we have 0 0.04 squared divided by 0 0.07 squared times 3. And that is 0 0.98 meters per second. So, this is now our velocity 2. Okay? How do we find the pressure? Oh, we're going to use the Bernoulli's equation. We're in pressure 1 plus 1 half rho. Uh, B sub 1 squared plus rho G H1 is equals to P sub 2 plus 1 half rho B sub 2 squared plus rho G H sub 2. Okay? And we are after the, we are after to find the P sub 2. So we have to isolate P sub 2. Okay? So we have P sub 1. Okay? Plus 1 half rho if we're going to factor it out, transpose this on the left side, okay, and factor out one half rho, okay, one half rho, that should be V1, V1 squared minus, minus V sub 2 squared plus rho G, okay, again, we're going to transpose this on the left side, okay, so that we can factor rho G, that is height 1 minus height 2. So the pressure 1 is, 140 kilopascals plus 1 half. The rho is 680. That's the density of the gasoline. V sub 1 is 3 squared, 3 meters squared, meter per second squared. Diba? I would not write the units so that we could consume a uh, little space. So 3 squared minus 0 0.98 squared plus the rho again. 680 kilograms per cubic meter times the G, that is 9.81 meter per second squared, multiplied by height 1 minus height 2. And according to our figure, height 1 is 6 meters. Okay, the reference is the height 2 is 0. So 6 minus 0 or simply 6. So we're going to compute the pressure 2 of that. Okay, let's try to compute 140 kilopascals plus 1 half. 680 times 3 squared minus 0 0.98 squared plus 680 times 9.81 times 6. And that is 182 or 183. Oops. So our answer should be what? 182.76 kilopascals. 182.76 kilopascals. 
So that's all. Okay. So thank you so much for listening. Here are our references: University Physics by Sir Wei and Modern Physics, University Physics by Young and Friedman, and Physics Book by Greg Gary B. Conrado. That is a Filipino author. So thank you so much for listening, and God bless you.